Uh, thanks, Fazila, and thanks for setting the broader context um, for this discussion. I think it's an important discussion to be having at this point in time, but before I get into um, dealing with the question at hand, I, I thought I might <clears throat> present some a bit of the global context so that we don't completely depress ourselves. I just heard today that uh, climate change depression is a real condition, apparently. So I don't want us to be completely um, depressed about things. So in the, in the global context, there are trends emerging that should give us some hope. And I'd like to, to share some of those trends. Um, while we might not be seeing the impacts directly in South Africa, or we might not be engaged in understanding those global trends, it was interesting that uh, a Bloomberg analysis actually recently said that the race for renewable energy globally has passed its tipping point. In other words, the renewable energy uh, race against fossil fuels has taken a turning point globally. Um, that's a very interesting trend and they're also predicting that that increasing capacity of renewable energy will continue. Uh, it's past the fossil fuel capacity by a few gigawatts. So in um, 2013, there was 143 gigawatts capacity of renewable energy uh, versus 141 gigawatts of fossil fuel capacity, 2013. They're predicting that, in fact, by 2030, four times more of that capacity will be built. And we also have witnessed the price of wind and solar plummet, and so it's becoming more uh, competitive. On the other front, my dearest uh, comrade Firil will talk about the growing global divestment campaign. So while in, in the energy um, markets we're seeing a turning point for renewables, competing quite strongly with fossil fuels. In the civil society space, or in the space of citizens, uh, in the space that citizens are engaged in, there's a very exciting growing movement called the global divestment movement that Fidel, I'm sure, will be talking about. And that divestment movement linked to a growing overall climate movement, and we've seen those developments um, happening across the world, you know, more and more people being mobilized asking the governments to take urgent action or divesting from fossil fuels. That is an important uh, and exciting trend globally. We do know that there are two big key events happening in the course of this year. The Sustainable Development Goals Summit that's happening in September. Energy is one of those goals on that agenda. And it's important, uh, you know, many people are engaged in, in those processes. And then, of course, we have the big UNFCCC COP happening at the end of the year in Paris. That's my day job. I actually lead the WWF uh, climate team, the global climate team, in these processes. Probably why one um, <coughs> might get depression, climate change depression. Um, but certainly, that's a key moment as well. And as we can see, around these big global moments, you also get momentum. So there's been some political momentum. Governments are suddenly waking up. Obama is suddenly traipsing across the world, meeting with all the emerging economies, talking about climate action. We have the basics up and down, uh, talking about bilaterals on climate action, and very much so putting renewable energy front and center of those uh, climate actions. So there's certainly opportunity for momentum, and not just on the you know, in terms of government actions, but certainly in terms of what civil society is doing in this space. And it's a, as I said earlier, it's a growing movement. And then finally, and I'm not covering all the global trends, but you know, just to end off with, um, um, I'm sure you are following the trends related to coal, particularly. Um, and the fact that there are more and more of the formal financial institutions who have signaled that they will no longer invest in coal. We're seeing those trends happening globally. So why are we not seeing that kind of positive momentum, not highly positive, but certainly a trend that could be positive and hopeful, reflect itself back home? So let me turn to the domestic context. I mean, I think that we all know that South Africa and Fazila's laid the context for that, has a long history of what 
we call the control of the minerals and energy complex in this country. And unfortunately, I would like to contend that uh, with our democracy in 1994, we have not seen the end of the entrenched vested interests of the minerals and energy complex in this country. And neither have we engaged uh, in, term, in relation to how we would restructure our economy in a way that takes us away from uh, the dependence on uh, minerals and an energy intensive economy. We've not done that as South Africa. So I would say that the context in which we finding ourselves now in terms of uh, the choices we have for energy options have very much been within that, the parameters of that mineral and energy uh, complex, including its past vested interests and its existing vested interests. The one thing that I'm certain about is that a crisis is one of the best ways to catalyze short-termism. And that is the biggest risk we face right now. So what we have is a reaction, as you said, even by the public, that we want an immediate solution. We don't care how we're going to get a solution. We just want load shedding to stop. So that crisis, unfortunately, takes us into a very dangerous path of making very you know, short-term decisions for quick fixes. And my understanding is that, unfortunately, those quick fixes in the minds of the government is going to be gas. Continue with coal, coal it will t take a bit longer, but gas is what they're going to be focusing on. And then, of course, uh, David will talk about all the exciting plans around nuclear. So there's a bit of movement, of course, on the renewable energy front, and we have to admit that the government has done uh, you know, quite a bit in relation to the uh, Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers program with bid four coming up as well. But it's not at scale and not at the levels at which it could have been if we didn't direct our funding into these, as you call it, false solutions. Uh, fracking will take an immense uh, funding and we can't even talk about nuclear. Maybe a bit of insight into the National Planning Commission because I suppose that's uh, <coughs> something uh, I could share some insights into. The National Planning Commission, the plan itself, does talk about energy and energy options. It talks about renewables. It uh, takes a very precautionary approach to nuclear. And in fact, it called for a serious cost benefit analysis before procurement goes out. But it does go on to talk about gas as a potential game changer, I confess. Very contested discussions in the National Planning Commission around this. And you will find somewhat, uh, an, uh, you know, the kind of contradictions between a chapter that deals with a transition to a low carbon economy uh, in relation to uh, the chapter on energy. There are contradictions because, you know, we promote uh, coal, uh, investment in coal infrastructure, rail for coal, etc., etc., in one part of the, um, the plan. And then on the other hand, we're talking about ensuring that South Africa fulfills its Copenhagen commitments on climate and uh, that we actually do have a just transition away from fossil fuels uh, and into a low carbon future. So the plan itself does have contradictory elements and I think given the kinds of trends that I've just spoken about earlier, um, this plan was adopted in 2011 and since then the global trends have indicated that there's really no future for coal. That understanding was not prevalent at the time the plan was drafted. So hopefully th this current term of the commission comes to an end at the end of this month. The new commission will take up these issues again and actually just look at what the current trends are and that coal, a coal future is actually a, a meaningless future in the country. So why are the public not interested or indifferent? I would like to argue, and I'm sure, again, that Fidel, I hope, <laughs> will be able to tell you all the good stories about mobilized society in South Africa. Yes, they might not be nationwide. They might not be, you know, this conversation's not happening every day, etc. But I don't think we should underestimate the fact that there's a growing, there has always been a movement. It's not been a renewable energy movement or climate change movement or necessarily an environmental movement per se. But when people fight for basic services in this country, whether, when they're mobilized for uh, health reasons against plants in, uh, in Durban or wherever, 
Those are struggles that have to be acknowledged as part of the overall climate struggle. And recently, um, I know that there's been a good uh, action against coal, the French funded coal plants in South Africa. So there's momentum. The challenge for us is, and this is a challenge to us as, I'm not sure uh, everybody in the audience, if everyone's in a uh, climate movement or you know, your daily uh, work is related to climate change, but anybody in the environmental sector in South Africa, I would argue, has a responsibility to make this top of the agenda. I, I'm going to make one very contentious comment right now. Uh, and it's been um, something I've observed since I've been involved in the environmental sector in South Africa. The biggest challenge in South Africa is that climate change and hence renewable energy within that is seen to be an environmental issue. Not an economic issue necessarily, not a social issue, an environmental issue more broadly. And very specifically in this country, we have still a huge challenge about a movement, an environmental movement or environmental issues being very much seen as a white middle class issue. So our challenge is going to have to be to build broader movements of people and connect their daily struggles their struggles in Soweto around electricity to the struggles against climate change and for renewable energy. <coughs> if we keep on keeping this at the level of an environmental issue, it's not going to gain any traction or credibility or legitimacy when we're trying to build a broader movement in the country. So this is the responsibility of all of us. WWF, 350, other organized sexes, of course, you play a role. All the organizations who are dealing with climate change and renewable energy in this country have a duty to actually start building wider and wider movements, connecting people's realities to something called climate change that everybody probably thinks is only going to happen after we're all dead in, at the end of the century. We've not succeeded. Even though we have hosted a COP and then, you know, the attention was there, COPs do that, and then it died down. So for me, I don't think there is an entirely indifferent public opinion. I think there is public opinion in the country. It is probably limited in its outreach, but there are wonderful signs of a growing movement and we will leave that to the Earth Life Africa's and 350, WWF isn't a very, um, we're not a grassroots, <laughs> let me just say that. We don't mobilize grassroots, but we certainly do form part of a wider climate movement. We do advocacy work, etc., etc. But it is going to take hard work in this country to get the nation speaking and the nation engaged. And we can't leave that up to government. It's not going to be government that's going to do that for us. They will not do that for us. It is our duty to make sure that public opinion is not indifferent to the issue of renewable energy, to the issue of climate change, and overall, more broadly, the issues of environmental degradation. I'm going to end it there um, with that, on that note. Thank you very much. And thanks for highlighting that it's broader than just um, an environmental issue. I hope that when we start unpacking in the discussion session, that we look at it more also from the perspective of the energy economy, because I think then we might be um, able to touch on an issue that the pub public cares about if we talk about the economy.